Today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar. Today's webinar is, in, is titled, Promoting Cycling and Walking for Sustainable and Healthy Cities, Lessons from Europe and North America, and we will be speaking with John Pooker, a professor at Rutgers University. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I will be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's speaker to make sure he is ready and that everyone can hear him. John, are you ready? I'm ready. This webinar has been submitted to AICP and may be approved for one and a half CM credits. The Road Safety Academy, the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, is a registered provider of CM credits. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit www.rsa.unc.edu. For more information on future webinars or to view the archives from this webinar series or others, please visit www.walkinginfo.org. Flash webinars. You can also stay abreast of PBIC webinars by following us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash petbike. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These, conditions, these courses can be found at www.walkinginfo.org slash training. Okay, okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Pedestrian Bicycling Information Center for making this entire series on livable communities possible. So many thanks to you and to Laura and to Carl for all you've done to coordinate this series. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, get a lot of benefit out of it. I know I have. I would also like to thank all of the participants in this webinar for taking out the time from your busy days uh, to uh, contribute to uh, our discussion of how to make bicycling and walking safer and more feasible for all groups uh, in society. I, I just wish that everyone taking part in this webinar could be right here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina right now, which is where I'm on sabbatical, uh, because let me tell you, it's 60 degrees, sunny, uh, the daffodils are blooming, the forsythia are blooming, and it's just about the most gorgeous day possible for walking and cycling. So. Uh, what is the topic for today? It is indeed. What can we do to promote these modes of transportation, walking and cycling? Uh, first of all, uh, I can just, it's not going down. James? What's, what's the matter? I'm sorry? It, it's just not advancing. Uh, click your mouse onto the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Voila. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so there's there's a lot of reasons for promoting walking and cycling, I and mean, uh, in a, in short, they're just about the perfect mo ways to get around in terms of our cities, in terms of the environment. Uh, clearly, they're the most sustainable modes of transportation. They're environmentally friendly. They're they're equitable. Uh, virtually everyone can afford to walk and to cycle. It's physical physically possible for most people. Um, and it also doesn't cost very much. So even from an economic point of view, uh, uh, walking and cycling are the most sustainable modes of transportation. So along these three dimensions, you can say walking and cycling are economically sustainable, socially sustainable, and environmentally sustainable. And they're also extraordinarily healthy. Uh, they're a fantastic source of physical activity, a lot more dependable than, say, going to the gym or using that exercise equipment in your basement because there's always an excuse for not doing it. Uh, but if you build into your daily lifestyle, walking and cycling, to go shopping, to go to work, to go to school, to visit friends, it's something you do automatically. And so I think that walking and cycling are an extraordinarily valuable sort of public health resource in that it builds in this physical activity automatically into our lifestyles. So we don't even think about it, yet it's really great for our health. And wow, do we need to have a lot more physical activity. Look at this map from the Centers for Disease Prevention, Control and Prevention, and you can see, I mean, a lot of the United States, especially the South Central area, sort of the Appalachian area and the South Central, um, have very low levels of physical activity. The, the map is showing actually inactivity. So the darker it is, the less activity there is. And so there's this very, very serious um, problem of, of lack of physical activity really throughout the United States, but especially in, in the sort of the south central area. 
uh, you'll see the, that there's also a tremendous problem of obesity. So also, I mean, it's not just in the south, in the uh, south central area, but is, it is concentrated there in the south and the south central area with a few pockets uh, elsewhere. I mean, it's a problem for the whole country, but it's especially bad in the south and the south central. Diabetes, you can see, again, really concentrated here uh, in the southeast. Heart disease, ditto. Uh, again, the same area of the country, uh, and especially states such as Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, tremendous problems of, of heart disease. And again, it's the same area of the country, the south, the southeast, uh, that has the highest rates of heart disease. Stroke, uh, it's a little bit more spread out. You have some even there in the northwest. Uh, but again, if you look at the overall map, it looks like you have the highest rates of stroke in the southeast and the south central part of the country. And look at this map, and I don't think it's by accident, that exactly in that part of the country where for most of those indices of stroke, of heart disease, of obesity, uh, and so forth, that that's where you have the most dominance of the automobile, where most people commute to work by by car as opposed to walking, cycling, or taking transit. Um, and looking across countries, so we were looking there, that was county by county data uh, uh, from the CDC, but if you look across countries, the same pattern really holds. Uh, this is just looking at obesity and not at the other indicators, but it does show that levels of obesity uh, increase dramatically as levels of car use uh, are higher. So this is actually showing you uh, if you look from the left of that chart to the right, you can see the green line is showing the uh, amount of walking and cycling. It's the percentage of people who walk or cycle, or the percentage of trips by walking or cycling in each of these countries. And you can see that the United States, Australia, Canada are very low, and then it goes up, 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 all the way to 50% when you get to the Netherlands and Switzerland. Uh, if you look at the levels of obesity, which is the red dotted line, you can see that it's, there's an inverse correlation that the, the more trips in a country are, that are made by, that is the higher percentage of the trips that are made by walking or cycling, the lower uh, the percentage of adults who are, in fact, obese. And that's a technical definition where the BMI is 30 or higher. So it's not just overweight, it's, it's grossly overweight. Uh, this is an especially troubling problem, I think, for children. We've had a quadrupling in the rate of obesity among children. You can see here uh, going from about 4% to 16% over this uh, time period you see on the chart. Um, and what you also see in the blue line is the percentage of children who walk or bike uh, to school. And you can see that it's plummeted. It's gone from about 40% uh, down to only about 10%. So it's, it's really uh, you can't claim that this proves that the reduction uh, in the rate of kids walking or cycling to school has caused the obesity rate to rise for children, but it certainly is consistent with that hypothesis. As you can see in the next slide, uh, we have huge differences here. Uh, it, it just gives you more detail than the previous slide had in terms of the percentage of trips by walking as opposed to by cycling. And you can see that at least within Europe, there's not that much difference in the percentage of trips by, by walking, but there's a huge difference uh, in the percentage of trips by cycling. So we have 2% in the UK, but it goes all the way up to 26% in the Netherlands. So that's probably the biggest. There's much more variation in terms of the rates of cycling than there is in the rate of walking. Um, and then, of course, we here, not of course, but we are, unfortunately, I should say, in the United States and Australia and so forth, at the end, the lower uh, the left-hand part of that chart, um, and just uh, it might confuse some of you that the United States appears twice, um, but the first time it appears is for the work trip, and the second time the USA appears there is for all trip purposes, including shopping, to school, and so forth. But no matter which index you use, what you find is the percentage of trips by walking or cycling is about two to three times higher in Europe than it is in the United States. Uh, lots of variation, of course, within each country. Uh, aggregating at the 
country level is a little bit dangerous because there is so much variation within uh, countries. And you can see this just is a, a somewhat arbitrary choice of cities within the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, Australia, and you can see ratios of 4 to 1, 5 to 1. In the case of the United States, Davis is at 16%, uh, New York is 0.6%. So huge variation among cities within the same country. One of the most surprising things we found was that cycling rates are about three times higher in Canada than they are in the United States. I don't think any American would expect this, um, but uh, you can see it. It is true, and most surprising is if you go to the Yukon, up way to the north, uh, that really dark area, 2.6, 2.1, uh, the very highest rates of cycling on the entire American continent are there in uh, Yukon Territory and the Northwest Territories. So um, having a cold climate uh, in general does not necessarily deter cycling. Um, and likewise, if you look here in the southeast, uh, where I am right now in North Carolina, 0.2 percent of trips by bike, uh, whereas you have uh, states such as uh, Minnesota, much colder states, uh, over three times as much cycling as we have here in the southeast, and you go to the west coast, uh, go to Oregon or Washington State where it's very rainy, uh, and you have uh, almost uh, 10 times or more uh, the percentage of trips uh, by biking. So anyway, both we, you can see here the variation very well, uh, state by state at least, uh, within the United States and also within Canada. But I do think it's interesting to look at the North American continent and just see how much variation there is. Um, even with the same cultures, we both have lots of cars, we both have very high per capita incomes, we both have lots of land and lots of resources, and yet very big differences here in uh, the levels of cycling. Uh, some of the good news I have to uh, uh, not that all the previous stuff was bad news, but the good news is it is certainly possible to significantly increase levels of cycling. Uh, this first slide shows you what's happened over the past decade or two in various cities around the world. And you can see even in cities such as Amsterdam and Copenhagen, cities that you think, well, they've just always been bicycling friendly. But you can see those are really huge increases, going from 25% of all trips to 37% or 38% of all trips. That is a very significant increase in cycling. Uh, if you look at a big city like Berlin, it's the biggest city in Germany, about 5 million people in the metropolitan area, going doubling the bike mode share from 5% to 10%. Um, and looking at another scale of cities, cities that started uh, with much lower levels of, of biking, uh, but they've also been successful. Paris, London, uh, Portland, Minneapolis. We look at Portland and Minneapolis here in the United States, we have it, they started out at about a 1%, and now uh, Minneapolis quadrupled its level of cycling, uh, Portland, uh, increased its level of cycling sixfold, and that's as a percentage. And so when you consider there's been an increase in overall travel, there's probably been a tenfold increase in the, in the total number of bike trips. This is as a percentage of bike commute trips, which is another issue, and that is clearly uh, cycling is more common in the United States, especially for recreational trips, for visiting friends, and so forth, uh, for exercise, for sports. And so, in fact, uh, Portland has its own survey, and it goes all the way up to almost 20% of all trips by bike in Portland now. Uh, we did a study for the U.S. Department of Transportation, the next slide, um, it, and it shows that in all of the cities we studied, from New York all the way to Portland, of course, we couldn't exclude Portland, one of my favorite cities, as uh, you can see here, uh, really dramatic increases, uh, doubling, tripling, quadrupling of the mode share, or the percentage of trips by bike in all of these cities. Um, I happened to give this talk in Los Angeles uh, a few months ago, and so I wanted to see, see where Los Angeles fits in. And it's right between New York and Chicago. It is the second largest city uh, in the United States, so I didn't want to leave out Los Angeles. But uh, it's been also, uh, in all of these cities, including Los Angeles, significant levels of increase in cycling. And I think that's very good news. It hasn't happened by itself. It's not just because of some demographic changes or improvements in the climate. It's because of specific public policies, government policies to improve conditions for cyclists, whether that's building bike lanes or cycle tracks or more bike parking or whatever. We'll get into those things later. Um, I would also like to show you how 
even within cities. We've looked at variation in cycling rates between countries. We've looked at variations um, within countries, among states and so forth, or regions of countries. But there's also tremendous variation in the levels of cycling, even within cities. Uh, here you see a GIS map of cycling levels in Manhattan. I, I note this is again the American Community Survey, so it's only the work trip. This understates total levels of cycling for sure, but what it does show you is that cycling is very, very, very concentrated here uh, in northwestern Brooklyn and in lower Manhattan. And once you get out to the eastern parts of Queens or the Bronx or New Jersey, it's I'm not going to say non-existent, but much, 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 much lower. So, so there's a tremendous spatial concentration of cycling, even within cities, primarily in the centers of the cities. Uh, but Los Angeles, it's not quite so simple. Now, Los Angeles, as you certainly know, is a very polycentric metropolitan area, and so it probably shouldn't surprise us that we all also have these sort of hot spots of cycling all over. Uh, whether it's pa Pas Pasadena or Irvine or uh, Marina del Rey and so forth, uh, or where USC is, that those are really the hot spots there. But again, it, there's a lot of variation even within cities and within metropolitan areas in terms of levels of, of cycling. Uh, another piece of good news is there's a whole lot we could do to increase walking and cycling, and the trips are short enough um, that you could make a lot of our trips, even here, even in the United States with our infamously sprawled low-density development, 27% uh, of all trips in 2009 were a mile or shorter. 41% of all trips uh, were two miles or shorter. And both of those distances, certainly two miles, uh, is very easy to cover on bike. I mean, I, I just biked into the office here at UNC this morning, and it's a two and a half mile ride, and I didn't even notice, and it's, it just was very easy. And I'm not young, I'm 62 years old, folks. <laughs> Uh, if I can do it, you can do it too. So at any rate, uh, for a mile or shorter, again, I think these are certainly, for the most part, for most people, they're walkable and bikeable distances. Um, so there's that potential. I guess that's the point, really, of this slide. There's a tremendous potential for more walking and bicycling. Yes, even in the United States, even with our given land use pattern, even given all the low density sprawl that we're uh, infamous for. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting is it is true uh, that in European cities, uh, trips tend to be somewhat shorter than in American cities. But even if you control for trip distance, and that's what this slide is showing, even if you control for trip distance, that is, you look within each trip distance category, and you say, OK, given this trip distance, how what percentage trips are made by walking and cycling? And what you see here, to me at least, is stunning. And that is, within each and every one of these trip distance categories, uh, Germans, Danes, and the Dutch bicycle for two, three, sometimes four or five times uh, the percentage of their trips by biking or walking as we do in the United States. So it's not just a matter of land use patterns. It's not just a matter of, oh, our trips in the United States are so long. It's a matter of even for short trips that Americans are much more likely to use their cars than they are to walk or to bike. One other big and very important difference, I think, between Europeans and uh, North Americans, any rate, is that we tend to cycle more for recreational purposes. Something like 70% of all trips are for recreation or sports or specifically for exercise, whereas Europeans cycle primarily for utilitarian purposes. That could be going shopping, going to school, going to work, to visit friends, uh, or whatever. And that's a huge difference. I remember uh, the, I know the, um, the woman who's the head of statistics for the Ministry of Transport in Copenhagen, and uh, she told me that 90 percent, uh, I couldn't believe the statistic, she said, yes, 90 percent of all of our trips in Denmark are for utilitarian purposes. We don't just bike for fun. We, we bike to get from point A to point B. I thought, whoa, very different than in the United States. Um, and one other, I think, really important difference is that um, women are much, much less likely to ride a bike in the United States, in the UK, and Canada than they are in Denmark, Germany, or the Netherlands. Uh, there's not really much difference if you look at the, the bluish, sort of a dark teal 
uh, bar there in the chart. That's the percentage of trips um, that women make by walking, and there's not really much difference here between the men and the women. But if you look at the cycle, there's a gigantic gap, a huge gender gap, and we have uh, men cycling for perhaps three to four times the percentage uh, of bike trips as the women do. So we have a really very male-dominated cycling scene here in North America and in the UK. Uh, whereas if you look at Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, in fact, if you look at the Netherlands and Denmark, I would just point out, most bike trips are by women. 55% of all bike trips are by women in Denmark and 56% in the Netherlands. So let no one claim that women are not able to cycle or for some weird reason less physically fit for cycling, that's just ridiculous. Uh, it's a matter of the conditions we provide. And I don't think it's a matter of culture, by the way, either. Uh, and this just repeats again, 55%. This is what cycling looks like in Copenhagen. It's mostly women, and you see perfectly normal bikes. People with, I know you're not going to like, some of you aren't going to like this, but people in Denmark just don't wear helmets, and that's the way cycling looks in, in Denmark. Uh, regular bikes, uh, I'm not even sure there's any gears whatsoever on these bikes, uh, but they're certainly not fancy, expensive bikes, uh, and they're not wearing Lycra. So this is either everyday people in everyday clothing, uh, and in fact, the majority of the bicyclists here are women. Uh, if you look at cities around the world, it turns out there's a, a very strong correlation between the percentage of women who bike and the overall mode share of bicycles. And it turns out the two are positively correlated. That is, the higher the percentage of bike trips that are made by women, the higher the overall share of trips made by bike overall. And uh, this is also confirmed. I've seen studies that look at this even at the neighborhood level. So we, you can see it. You can go back here. You can see this at the country level. I mean, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands have much, much, much higher levels of overall cycling than Canada, the UK, or the USA. So here it's showing that as, as you get more women on bikes, uh, everyone's getting on bikes. It's increasing the overall mode share of bikes. This is showing that uh, in, on the city level, that the, the higher the percentage of bikes, uh, trips, uh, the higher percentage of trips, uh, bike trips made by women, uh, the higher the mode share of cycling in each of these cities. And various studies then go down to the neighborhood level within cities, and they show exactly the same thing. Those neighborhoods that have the highest percentage of bicycling by women also have the highest overall bike mode share. And I would conclude from this that if you really want to get people on bikes, first of all, get women on bikes. And ask women, what do you want? Finally, give women what they want, and it turns out later uh, what women want is separation from uh, motor vehicle traffic more than anything else to get them on bikes. But it's finally time for men to listen to women and to really ask them, what do you want? What does it take to get you on a bike? Uh, and that, getting women on bikes, I think, is one of the keys to increasing the overall share of cycling. Uh, Another, I think, very important issue is what happens to us as we get older? Uh, do we think we're going to be somehow less able to get around uh, by active travel, by walking and cycling? I sure hope not. <laughs> I'm 62. I'm getting older year by year, just as you are. And the populations um, of almost all the OECD countries, so in North America, Western Europe, and so forth, we're all getting older and older. A higher and higher percentage of our populations are over 60, over 70, over 80. Well, what's going to, how are we going to get around as we get older? Well, I certainly hope that as I get older, I can continue to walk and to bike. And you can see, if you look at Germany or Denmark or the Netherlands, that's exactly what happens. As people get older and older and older, they're making a higher and higher percentage of their trips by walking or by biking. And imagine, I mean, look at Germany, for example. 10% of all people, all Germans who are 65 and older, 10% of their trips by bike. In Denmark, get this. Those between 70 and 84 years old make 15% of the trips by bike. And in the Netherlands, it's 23% of those who are 65 and older. So again, 
anyone who claims that just because you're old you can't get on a bike is just a bunch of baloney. You can very clearly see this evidence that if you make cycling conditions safe and convenient and comfortable enough, you will also get seniors on bikes just as you will get children on bikes just as you will get women on bikes. Um, if you look at the U.S. and the U.K., it's just the reverse. I mean, first of all, we have low levels, much, much lower levels of cycling to begin with and also lower levels of walking, uh, but you find that they do actually decline. Uh, for example, in the United States, we go from 0.8% to 0.5%. Um, so I think this is a really important issue in all three of these groups, whether it's children or the seniors uh, or women. I think it is a matter of social justice. It's a matter of saying we need to make cycling possible, feasible, safe for all segments of society. And by doing so, we're not just accomplishing the goal of equity and social justice. We're going to tremendously increase the overall levels of cycling. So I do think we should make cycling uh, possible for all ages. Uh, and this is a picture that I took when I was in Portland a few years ago. And I just think it represents, I think it's great, uh, uh, parents cycling with the kids. Uh, and now, of course, they're wearing helmets here in Portland. That's fine. I wear a helmet when I'm cycling here in North Carolina or in New Jersey. Um, and a very nice facility here in Portland, as you said, as I mentioned earlier, has had tremendous success. I mean, probably at least a tenfold increase in, in all cycling for all trip purposes and a sixfold increase just looking at the, the trip to work. So they've done a lot. It hasn't happened by accident. They have really done a lot in terms of better bike facilities, better bike parking, lots of promotional programs, uh, and so forth. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, one of the crucial things we need to do is make cycling safer. I think it's one of the major deterrents to most people, especially it's a deterrent uh, for parents of children, it's a deterrent for seniors, and it's a deterrent for women. There's just no question. You can have look at surveys or look at how people are acting, and everyone says, make cycling safe, and then I'll do it. So I think we really do need to make cycling safer, and the good news is you can do it. If you look at the next slide here, the Netherlands and Denmark, uh, they've managed to make cycling about 10 times safer that it is in the United States. Now these are rates of um, killed or injured cyclists um, or pedestrians here also, we should find both walking and cycling on this chart. Uh, both walking and cycling are about eight times, ten times safer in the Netherlands or Denmark. This is per kilometer walked, per kilometer cycle than they are in the United States. Now can't you imagine that does make a difference? Uh, so cycling is perceived as being dangerous by many people in the United States, it's, if you go to the Netherlands or Denmark or Germany, it's just not perceived as being dangerous, and that's precisely why they don't wear helmets. Uh, I'm not against helmets, by the way. I don't want to make a big issue of that. I think I, mean, I certainly wear a helmet myself here in, New Jer in North Carolina or in New Jersey, um, but I think it's, it's, it's a goal to, to work toward, to make cycling so safe that people don't even think they need to wear helmets. And then you're going to get a lot of your society uh, cycling on a daily basis. It wasn't always that way. Uh, we often assume, oh, you know, these countries such as the Netherlands and, and Denmark, they were always so great for cycling. Uh, well, if you look here, uh, they had a tremendous problem with uh, cyclist fatalities back in 1970. Uh, they have reduced cycling fatalities to only 20 to 40 percent of what they were uh, back in 1970. So on average, you would say it's a 70 percent decline, a 70, 70, 70 percent decline in cyclist fatalities over that period, whereas in the United States, we've made much less progress, and most of that decline to the extent that it exists at all is because of fewer children on bikes, unfortunately. Trends of pedestrian fatalities, they've been going down everywhere in the United States. It's mainly because fewer people are walking. Um, that's part of the reason also, if you look at the European countries, rates of walking have tended to decline uh, while rates of cycling have increased. There's sort of a long story behind that, which I don't have time to tell. But at any rate, you can certainly see that these European countries have made much, much, much greater progress in terms of reducing pedestrian uh, 
fatalities. Safety in numbers, a colleague of mine, a very good friend, uh, Peter Jacobson out in California, uh, came up with this notion and it's been confirmed again and again and again. As levels of cycling increase, and this goes uh, also applies for walking, as levels of walking and cycling increase, the injury and fatality rates per trip and per kilometer fall. And there are several reasons for this, but the main reason is the more cyclists you get on the road, the more pedestrians you have crossing intersections or crossing crosswalks, the more visible you become, the more likely motorists will see you, and the less likely you are to be hurt. The other issue is the more people you have walking and cycling, uh, the more likely it is that the motorists who are creating really the danger, they're the ones who are driving around two-ton vehicles at uh, 30 or 40 or 50 miles an hour and really creating that risk for vulnerable uh, uh, cyclists and, and pedestrians. Um, that what happens is motorists, there's a higher percentage of motorists are also at some time a pedestrian or a cyclist. Go to the Netherlands, every single uh, motorist in the Netherlands is also a cyclist. So of course they're not going to be anti-cyclists. Uh, so that's another reason I think for this, this uh, uh, phenomenon of safety and numbers. But there's one more thing I would add to it, and that is the more people who walk and cycle, the more political support, the more public support there is for providing those very facilities and programs uh, that make walking and cycling safer and more convenient and more, more feasible, making more connections. Uh, the safety and numbers also gets confirmed. We, this is the study, again, we did for United States Department of Transportation. But uh, if you look at these different cities, we're looking at annual fatalities per 10,000 uh, daily cyclists. Um, and what you see here again is those cities that have the highest uh, share of cycling, the highest bike share of workers, um, also have the safest cycling. So again, when you look at different cities uh, at the same period in time, what you find is this phenomenon of safety in numbers holds. It holds over time, it holds among countries, and it holds also among different cities. Uh, and this also, if you look at one particular city over time, this is uh, Portland, our, our model, to follow I think in many ways here in North America. Um, they had a tremendous increase in the levels of cycling across the bridges going across the Willamette River there. This is something like, a, I'm not sure it's a three, four, five-fold increase, uh, look at the, the green bars, uh, what happened to the number of crashes? Almost nothing. I mean, almost no increase at all in the number of crashes. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the crash rate? It went way down. It means that cycling became about four or five times safer as the amount of cycling increased four, five, or six-fold. So again, this notion of the phenomena of safety and number really does hold, whether it's for a particular city over time or across cities or across countries. Public policies, though, it doesn't just doesn't happen by itself. It's public policies are really, really crucial to promoting walking and cycling. And as I mentioned earlier, suggested earlier, it wasn't always the case that uh, these European cities were a cycling or walking paradise. Uh, they basically had pro-car uh, policies in the 1950s and 1960s, and they did cause a huge decline in levels of walking and cycling. So it wasn't always the paradise that you see today. There was then a dramatic turnaround in the 1970s. There was an environmental movement, there was the issue of the energy crisis, but also much more awareness of the importance of the inner city, of the livability of the inner city, of, the, the, of preserving that all the inner city has to offer and promoting walking, cycling, and uh, also public transit, a key uh, part of the green transportation package modes. Um, just as an example of this, this is what Freiburg, this is a particular bridge, uh, I can never pronounce the name of it, but it's a bridge in Freiburg, Germany uh, in the 1960s. This is what it looks like today. Uh, and that really portrays the shift in priorities. It's saying in the 1960s, it was the priority was the car. Today, the priority is cycling and walking, but especially cycling in Freiburg. Uh, this is a very important uh, before and after comparison. Uh, this is a, the exact same street before and after in Freiburg, Germany. It's Kladerstrasse, and you can see the before is ugly, ugly, ugly. You have cars even parked on the sidewalk. This is not a street that's friendly for anything, but certainly not for walking or for cycling. It's just a terrible street. Look to the right. 
almost 95% of all the streets in Freiburg, this is what they've done. They have traffic calmed these streets. Not what they've done, they've brought down the level of the street lighting to a more humane scale. They've narrowed the street. They put in bike parking. They put in these bollards. They put in uh, shrubbery and trees and so forth. Uh, I don't think there's any of you who are participating in this webinar who could claim that the picture on the right is not more beautiful than the one on the left. It's a much more beautiful, it, it really is an enhancement of that neighborhood overall. Incidentally, there have been specific studies done on what is the impact of this sort of traffic calming on injuries and fatalities. What they found is a 60 to 80 percent decline in pedestrian and cyclist injuries and fatalities after they have introduced traffic calming. I repeat, 60 to 80 percent decline in walking and cyclist fatalities uh, and injuries. There is absolutely no question that this sort of a traffic calming, and not only does it encourage more walking and cycling, but it makes it much safer. And guess who benefits the most? Children. That what they found is the rate of fatalities and injuries decline the most steeply for children. So why aren't we willing to do this sort of a thing for our kids to give them a nice front yard and where they're not going to be run over by cars at 50 or 60 miles an hour? Another slide, I'll be try to uh, be a little bit quicker here, but you can see here um, another, this is the same city, this is Freiburg, Germany. You can see uh, in the 1960s you have the, the cathedral place, or cathedral square, uh, was nothing but a parking lot. What did they do? They took out the cars, they turned it into a very beautiful um, uh, market. It's there actually every day except Sunday they have this market here. It's been very, very, very successful. How do we encourage more walking and cycling? Well, the no-brainer is more cycling and, and walking facilities and better facilities. We need to integrate walking and cycling with public transport, traffic calming, the pictures I just showed you. Mixed-use zoning is crucial. Restrictions on car use, traffic education, traffic regulations, and enforcement. Now we'll go through a few of these. Um, first of all, you can see in virtually any European city you go to, you're going to see something like this. Maybe not as much cycling as you see here in Münster, Germany, but you're going to find extensive, and I don't mean one street, but a whole network of interconnecting streets of car-free streets where you can walk or cycle safely without inhaling exhaust fumes from cars, without hearing the noise of cars, and above all, without being run over by cars. Uh, this is a very, very nice uh, pedestrian street in Quebec City. I was there uh, just in August, and that used to be a street for cars. Well, they just took out the cars and gave it to people. And let me tell you, folks, I think it looks a lot better with people than it would with cars. I think people look better than cars, and I also think they're more important than cars. And I think that much of what we do in our policies, we have to ask our question, who are we serving? Are we serving cars, or are we serving people? Is our, is our, is our purpose to help people? or to help cars go faster and faster. I think it should be this, uh, give the priority to pedestrians and to cyclists as well. Another example of things that can be done here in the United States, this is Santa Barbara, California. It used to be a regular street with cars. They closed it off, and now it's a street, uh, it's a pedestrian space. It's safe, it's quiet, it's very, very pleasant. Um, Another thing that's been done this week, and uh, many years ago, 30, oh, how many years, almost 40 years ago, I was here uh, at Harvard Square, I had an office, and this was just a regular street, it was totally unattractive, they turned it into a shared street, that's a maximum of 10 miles per hour for cars, and what's happened is the pedestrians have completely taken it over, which I'm in favor of, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it's something you can do, and really, you can see, it encourages safe uh, walking, and encourages more walking, just because it is more pleasant. Uh, and this is something I really especially wanted to show you, and that is uh, we often think you need elaborate facilities to encourage walking and cycling. Uh, this is a typical um, scene in German suburbia. Uh, and actually, I was taking a bike ride along with this friend of mine, uh, Stefan, and this is what, what is typical now. There's no sidewalk. There's no special bike lane. The entire width of the street is shared. And you can see there's a sign then that says, this is a, in German it's called Spielstrasse, play street. But uh, it limits officially by law the speed limit to seven kilometers an hour, which is something like four or five miles an hour. But kids can play here. You can bike here. You can, you can walk here. Or you can drive your car, but only at the mercy of the other users. Or you're sharing this with others. And so you're going much more 
more slowly. We could do the same thing here in the United States. Uh, that many people would have thought this was impossible, just impossible. But I think uh, we have an extraordinarily courageous, uh, and I would even say brilliant, a commissioner of transportation in New York City, uh, Jeanette Sedek Khan, who uh, has taken Broadway and turned it into a very good place for just sitting down, for walking, uh, and for cycling as well. There actually, you can't see it here, but there is actually a cycle path that goes through, goes all the way down Broadway, as a matter of fact, with special signals and no left turns for cars and so forth. One of the most uh, common car-free zones in the United States are, in fact, the uh, college campuses. And this is where I am right now. I just took my noon walk, right where you're looking. <laughs> And let me tell you, it's at 60 degrees, and on a sunny day like today, um, there's no better place to take a walk. Uh, and if you haven't been to Chapel Hill, you've really missed out on something. Uh, and if you haven't been to Santa Barbara, you've missed out on something, too, because I was there in uh, mid-October. And just a wonderful, wonderful uh, campus for cycling. I think I would just guess 90% of the trips by students on that campus are by bike. And it's not by accident. It's not just because they're young. There are many college campuses where almost no one is on a bike. People are riding bikes, these students, because it's safe, it's convenient, and there's superbly designed facilities. Also, really great parking. Getting back to pedestrians, I think crosswalks are an obviously very important thing. Uh, what we normally get in New Jersey, which is uh, where I am normally, uh, is you get this sort of a, a sign in the middle of a four-lane street, and it's intimidating. It's a, it's a long distance to cross, even for a normal person, if you have any sort of a disability, if you're a child, if you're a senior. If, it's very intimidating crossing this sort of a wide street. And in fact, in New Jersey, this sign is usually uh, slam down because the car has run into it. So it's not doesn't provide a whole lot of safety. If you look at the bottom example, this is uh, actually from Santa Barbara. And again, this is much safer. You put in a stop sign, you narrow the street. Uh, it, it clearly, this is a much safer crossing uh, below. The other thing I'll just note, this is also the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, that if you have high volumes of walking and high volumes of cycling, it's then just crucial to separate the, the cyclists from the pedestrians. Otherwise, they conflict with each other. Another example of that separation, also in Santa Barbara, um, is here. This on the, there's a coastal sort of a way that they a coastal path they have. But one of the most interesting things about this photograph is um, where they they have the bikeway now. That used to be two car lanes, so they took two car lanes away from the motorists and they gave it to the bicyclists. And isn't this a nice looking facility? Totally aside from palm trees and so forth and the sunshine, uh, it's a really nice facility, separates the pedestrians from the cyclists, but the most important point here is, I keep on hearing the, this argument, oh, we just don't have enough space to provide facilities for cyclists. I would say baloney. It's a matter of priorities. What do you think is more important, people or cars? And that's really the choice I think we as planners have to make in, in our minds and to, to convince the public this is really better for them as well uh, and for their children. Uh, one of the things that they did in San Francisco, as you can see, left is before and then to the right is after. The, it was a very, very wide street. There wasn't much traffic. Uh, and so what they did is they created a cycle track. They took part of that street and dedicated it to a two-way cycle track, which is protected by this fence uh, from the motor vehicle traffic. So again, turns it into a, a, a physically separated cycle track. Another example of a, a bikeway, this is one is in the Netherlands. And I will just call your attention to the following. You see three cyclists cycling uh, right next to each other, uh, and two or two cyclists next to each other. You know, that's great. You know, if you have a really wide bikeway, I know we can't always do it, but I like to talk to other people while I'm cycling. <laughs> and I think that often our cycling facilities in the United States are so narrow, it's like you're trying to talk to someone that's uh, 20 feet ahead of you, and it's much more difficult. So it's a more, I think, a more social, uh, socially conducive form of sort of cycling facility. Uh, and you can see again, I know a lot of you aren't going to like this, but in the Netherlands, no one wears a helmet. And yet they have a fatality and injury rate for cycling that's a tenth of what we have in the United States. Another example, this is from The Hague in the Netherlands, of a cycle track, a completely different design. But you can see, if you look very carefully here, I hope you can see the cursor here. With the, this is, you have a curb that separates the um, the cycle track from the motor vehicle traffic here, and you also have a slight curb here and also a different pavement uh, type 
that uh, separates the cyclists from the pedestrians. But I'll also just call your attention to the following. Uh, this shows priorities. Look at how narrow this roadway is. It just shows you, well, we don't really want more than that many cars there, but we're going to give a lot of space to the pedestrians and the cyclists. Again, it's not that the space doesn't exist. Netherlands, by the way, is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And, and so you could think, well, it really has space problems, and yet it sets its priorities to favor pedestrians and cyclists. It's a matter of priorities. Here is a, uh, two different types of cycle tracks, both in Montreal. They're, these are bi-directional in Montreal. They're on one side of the street. Um, uh, the, the design to the left is a somewhat older design with these green, uh, these green bollards here. And to the right is the newest design where they have permanent concrete uh, barriers. But I was on this. Uh, they have the most extensive network, actually, of cycle tracks in North America. Uh, and were among the first ever to have cycle tracks uh, as well. I was there in uh, September. Really, really nice facilities. But we can do things uh, well in the United States as well. Uh, this is, uh, we have, there's I think now 10 or so cycle tracks in New York City. Uh, mostly, I think all of them actually in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, but this is the one on Ninth Avenue looking south in Manhattan, and you can see a number of things. First of all, you have physical barriers, I mean significant uh, physical barriers between the cyclists and, in fact, park cars, and then you have the motor vehicle traffic here. So you really are protecting these cyclists. You're not going to have a car running into these cyclists from the side. In addition to which, you have special signals. So you're not going to get left hooked by a car as you're crossing the intersection. So the bicyclist gets the green light, and the motorist gets the red light, plus it's clearly indicated as a bike path. Uh, in Washington, D.C., our, our capital, uh, we can see right down uh, Massachusetts Avenue, or Pennsylvania Avenue, rather, uh, there's a cycle track right down the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, now, I've shown a lot of photos of cycle tracks and not that many of bike lanes. Clearly, bike lanes are uh, the, the most frequent type of bike infrastructure that we have in the United States, so I didn't want to ignore that for sure. Um, they're, they're cheaper, obviously, than the cycle tracks. Uh, they don't take as much time to install, for the most part. Um, but there is a problem. By the way, just in case you're curious, to so the right is in New York City, in Manhattan. To the left is in Santa Barbara. Uh, there are problems. Now, I biked in this morning, and I encountered this problem. I was on a bike lane here in Chapel Hill, and it was blocked. <laughs> and this is what happens with bike lanes. They typically I'm not sure about typically, but too often get blocked by, in this case, cars. This is in, in Greenwich Village in New York City. They're blocking the entire lane because cars are just using it for parking. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a, a really serious problem in New York City, delivery vehicles blocking the bike lane. And this is a problem throughout the world, um, maybe with the exception of the Netherlands, and that's Doring. Uh, it's often the number one source of cyclist injuries is Doring. Well, the, the long and the short of this is there's no really one solution. What is the right kind of cycling facility? It really depends. It depends on two things. It depends on the volume of traffic, or three things, the volume of traffic, the speed of traffic, and also the mix of traffic. If you have a lot of trucks, a lot of buses, so large vehicles going at a high speed uh, with lots of volume, you're going to want the most possible physical separation of the cyclist from the motor vehicle traffic. If you have a local residential street with low volumes of traffic, with very few big vehicles, uh, and with not very many uh, vehicles coming through, then you really don't need any facility at all. It's like a traffic calm neighborhood street, such as I showed you in one of the earlier slides. We have been expanding in almost all North American cities our, our bike lane and bike path system. So, uh, that's a positive step forward. Uh, if you look Portland alone, I mean, they, uh, it's, these bridge connections are really crucial, uh, and Portland realized that very soon, and uh, they vastly improved the uh, bicycling connections over the, the bridges over the Willamette River, and now they have 20,000 daily bike trips over uh, these Willamette River bridges. Um, is that other, just another example of a, a bike bridge here? This happens to me. Actually, I know the title says North America and Europe. This one is actually when I'm cycling with a group of, of kids, of uh, friends of mine in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, this is what it looks like. I mean, just as it's good to get over uh, water, it's good to be able to get under uh, 
uh, overpasses like this. This is a cycle, the cycle track in Montreal. It's also an interesting view of the cycle track. You can really very clearly see the concrete separator between the cycle track and the cars. And let me tell you folks, it wasn't always that way. This used to be just a car lane. They used to have the cycle path, or whatever you want to call it, or lane, on the sidewalk shared with the pedestrians. Well, they did away with the lane of traffic or two lanes of traffic to create this uh, cycle track. And again, it's a matter of priorities. Montreal decided they wanted to promote cycling, and this is what they did. They took space away from their car, and they gave it to the cyclists, and they had huge increases in cycling. Traffic signal priority, I'm really in favor of giving an advanced green light to the cyclist. If you go to the Netherlands, if you go to Germany, if you go to Denmark, it's very often the case that you get an advanced uh, green light. In Portland, they have something, this, one of the intersections like a, a bike scramble, I think they call it, uh, and it's where the lights are red for the cars uh, in every direction, and so the cyclist can go diagonally or whatever direction they want to, and they don't have to worry about it. And then you place your bike on this uh, little indicator here, and it automatically then turns the light red for the cars and green uh, for the bikes. And I must confess to you, I enjoy doing this so much that the cars got very angry with me. <laughs> uh, so uh, you can also have a pedestrian scramble. And I've seen them in Sydney, Australia. You often hear in Toronto, Canada, I'm sure many cities have these. But it just makes it more convenient. If you're trying to go diagonally, why should you have to cross twice? Make the car stop in every direction and let the uh, pedestrians cross diagonally. You can increase the safety of crossings by uh, introducing this sort of you paint the bike lanes when they're going across the intersection. Uh, this is a really nice illustration, I think, of how to prioritize cycling. This is in Münster, Germany, and the uh, bike planner uh, from Münster, Martina Guttler, actually took this photo for me. And it, what it shows is the following. Um, you first of all have a bike access lane to get you to the front of the intersection. So you don't have to wait behind these polluting cars. When I'm taking my bike rides back to Carborough or Chapel Hill, uh, I have to wait behind these cars, inhaling the fumes, uh, and then they get to be and start before me anyway. Well, it's just the opposite here. Again, it's a matter of priorities, not just space, but also time. <clears throat> so here you have a special lane to let the cyclist get to the intersection. There's a sign here that says, when the light is red, cyclists should fill up this, in, take an advanced stop line, and they fill up the entire box here in front of the cars. Then they get an advanced green light, and as you can see, they're almost through the intersection by the time the cars are even starting. It's faster for the bikes, it's safer for the bikes, and they're not having to inhale all those exhaust fumes. There are different designs to uh, advanced stop lines. You can either have one like this. Uh, this is in Berlin, actually, without a bike box. Or this is the one, this is a photo that Jennifer Dill kindly let me use, uh, where you have a bike box uh, plus an advanced stop line. So there's many different designs. This is a design in, in Vancouver, uh, a little bit different. Uh, sort of uh, take on the design of the bike box. But I think they're really useful. Um, the other thing you can do is time signals for cyclists instead of for cars. Uh, and this is what's done, in fact, in Denmark and in the Netherlands. You often will have a green way for cyclists, not the green way for cars. Uh, in this uh, case, in Odense, they actually have a pulsating, wa pulsating wave of green laser lights along these bollards so that if you keep track with this wave of pulsating lights, you will always, as a cyclist, get a green light at an intersection. I wish we had that sort of careful, <laughs> considerate planning for cyclists in the United States. Traffic calming, it's a lot of different things, uh, but the main uh, purpose of traffic calming is to reduce car speeds, because speed does kill. And it makes a difference. If you'll notice, the, the, if, you, if you're in Europe, you will see that almost all the neighborhoods are traffic calm at about 30 kilometers an hour or less. And it's not by accident. Because by, uh, you can see here, over 30 kilometers an hour, the, the probability that a pedestrian will be killed by a car crash increases astronomically. You can see just absolutely astronomically. And by the time you're at 50 miles an hour, it's 85%. 85% chance you're going to be able to get killed by the car. And so I don't think it's by, by chance that the European cities generally almost always uh, choose 30 kilometers an hour as the uh, traffic calming speed limit. 
The other thing you can do is you, you don't really want through traffic in your residential neighborhoods. It makes them noisier, more polluted, uh, and above all, it makes them less safe. And so many cities throughout the, uh, the world, actually, have undertaken measures to block cars going uh, through residential neighborhoods. This is just one design uh, where you have a cut through for bicyclists, but it's a dead end for cars. This is another approach uh, uh, in Canada. So above is Quebec City and below is in Montreal. And you'll see me on the bike right there. <laughs> but it's not very, it, this is not, doesn't cost millions of dollars. You can see it allows the cyclist to go through, but it, it makes it virtually a dead end for the, for the car. The, the car has to turn left here or it has to turn right down here. Uh, Berkeley, California has a lot of these uh, diverters. They have a somewhat different design, as you can tell, and they have a barrier here so cars can't get through. But this is a great connector for two different bicycling boulevards uh, in Berkeley, California. No cars, but it, it's a great, it really greatly, these sorts of dead ends for cars and cut-throughs for cyclists greatly increase the route flexibility and also the, the overall speed for cycling. I don't mean speed in terms of miles per hour, but it just makes the trip distance shorter because you could choose whatever route uh, works out best for you. This is an example of traffic calming in Sydney, Australia, where I was uh, about six years ago for a year as a visiting professor at the University of Sydney. But it was they had uh, in in Sydney they had dozens and dozens of these. These used to be simply streets, and you had what they call rat running them. But you had lots of cars going through residential neighborhoods, cars and trucks, um, and too many children actually were getting killed by these cars and trucks and cars. Um, there, were using these simply as, as shortcuts to get through uh, and around the main arterials. Well, they did away with that because they made all of these uh, dead ends then for cars and trucks. And they made them very, very pleasant uh, cut-throughs for pedestrians and cyclists. Another example of traffic calming, this is in Freiburg, Germany. And I think the point I would uh, emphasize here is it doesn't take a gazillion dollars to do this. There's a bollard here, a bollard here, and some paint on the street here and here. And that makes it, that it, suffices. It doesn't really, you can't really claim that traffic calming requires all that much money. Uh, one of the other, one type of traffic calming, especially uh, encourages cycling, it sets up a route in a way. It's a traffic calmed route, uh, but it's especially designed for cyclists so that stop signs, for example, are at the perpendicular cross streets and not on the street that's the bike boulevard, uh, but all sorts of obstacles, traffic ions, and so forth for the uh, automobiles and other things that prevent cars from using this as a through route. So it speeds up uh, the, the cycling for the cyclists, but on the other hand, deters through traffic by, by cars. And by the way, I think it's important to note, I mean, although Portland was the, um, the, the really path-breaking in terms of introducing these bike boulevards in the United States, we now have 15 cities, probably even more now since I did this first presentation, but uh, 15 cities in the United States now with bike boulevards. Bike transit integration is also crucial uh, because you can't cover all all the distance you want to cover, if you, you can't really, I mean, some people can bike 15, 20, 30 miles, but sometimes uh, you can't, and you want to have, be able to take the bike with you um, or be able to park it uh, at the station. So this is an example. Of, this is the main form of bike transit integration in the United States, in fact, is bike racks on buses. We have, we have over 50,000 buses in the United States. I think it's now over 80% of all buses in the United States have bike racks on them. Uh, Another way, a great way, of sort of bikes on board is here on the Caltrain in San Francisco. <laughs> in fact, there's a, it's so popular uh, they need to put on even more cars uh, because it's a great, great way to get your, your bike into San Francisco, and then you have your bike with you to go wherever you want to go to the end destination. So you can't see it too well here, but the cyclists sit up here in the seats, and they park their bikes down here, and there are several cars on the peak hour trains that uh, accommodate this sort of bike parking. It's really, really, really nice. Another kind of bike transit integration, you can see here we have the, the metro station. This is in Montreal. You can also have another view here of what a cycle track looks like. It's two-directional, and you can see here the special signals, special waiting, advanced stop line, and so forth. And you can also see, if any of you wonder what it looked like, this is the Big C, their bike sharing program. Uh, this is what one of their bike docking stations looks like. So you can take the metro and then hop on a bike, 
and go wherever you want to go. So it's, it's sort of integrating the bicycle with uh, the uh, public transit as well. And uh, I can't resist mentioning to you, bike sharing, I think, is not a surprise to any of you uh, participating in this webinar. It's one of the biggest trends uh, in the United States. There are over 20 now. Uh, it, the, the number increases by the day, practically, over 20 bike sharing systems in North America. So, uh, And there is one, I believe it's going to start up in May or June in um, New York City. And I think that's going to then be the biggest in North America. Currently, Montreal is the biggest with 5,000 bikes. I believe New York City has revised its plans and will now be introducing, I think it's 5,500 bikes. At any rate, it is certainly a very important trend, uh, and it's been a big inducement. It's been I'm not sure if I would describe it as a promotional program, but it certainly has encouraged a lot more cycling in every single city in the world. And I've looked at a lot of different cities. I don't know of a single city where it hasn't encouraged more cycling. Another form of transit integration, you can provide bike parking at transit stations. So this happens to be right next to Union Station in Washington, D.C. You have a metro station there, plus it's right next to the long distance train station. Or you can have something simpler, such as the at the end of the red line in in, uh, in Boston, uh, you have bike cages. Uh, it's not as luxurious, <laughs> but it's not full service, but you at least have uh, security. You have a key to get in here, and it's sheltered. So I think there is something to be said for this. It's a cheaper solution, um, but I think it works. It's secure, and it's sheltered. Another thing you can do, again, this is a matter of priorities, is you can take away car parking and turn it into bike parking. Uh, you can make something like 10 bike parking spaces out of one car parking space. And why in the world wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> aren't bikes more important than cars? Yes. Um, well, that's my own personal opinion. I'm sorry. But uh, at any rate, uh, you can see here, this has been actually a grassroots movement. It's not as if the city comes in. This is the case, there's 27 bike corrals in San Francisco uh, and 95 bike corrals in Portland. Uh, and Sarah Figliosi has been the director of this bike corral program and a wonderful job uh, introducing all these bike corrals and improving the design year by year. But this is grassroots. The city doesn't impose this uh, on anybody. These businesses, cafes, shops, whatever it is, are begging the city, please take out the car parking and give us a bike corral instead. There are waiting lists. Uh, the city can't build these fast enough. So there's a huge potential demand, uh, unmet, still unmet, in both of these cities and probably throughout the United States. Uh, it's very easy to do. It's not expensive. And as again, you can get 10 bikes. Uh, and that means 10 customers, by the way, for every one car. Uh, that could be parked there. So I think even from an economic point of view, it's better for business. Traffic education is key, uh, both for motorists and also for cyclists. Uh, so I really, I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, it's, it's, it's important to build the infrastructure, to provide the parking, to provide those bike lanes and cycle tracks and special signaling at intersections and special intersection treatments, but Education is key, training both of cyclists and of the motorists. Um, and just an example of this, I think it's uh, one of the things we neglect, uh, I think it's actually almost a crime, uh, certainly in terms of criminal negligence, we, we really don't train motorists how to drive in a way that avoids endangering pedestrians and cyclists. These happen to be, uh, my, my colleague, Ralph Bühler, uh, downloaded these from the official sample driver license test for Germany. And there are multiple choice questions, you can't see them, associated with each of these four pictures. And it's basically, it's A, B, C, D, E. What are you supposed to do? Well, in every case, what you're supposed to do is yield to the pedestrian or yield to the cyclist, you as the motorist. Uh, in the case of the lower right, I had to ask, well, well, what does this mean? What's this all about? I just see a kid on a bike. What's that all about? Well, what it's about is you as a motorist are responsible if you hit that cyclist. If that kid on a cyclist darts out into the street, it's your fault as a motorist. Because by law, you as a motorist are supposed to be proactively anticipating the possibility that a child or a senior, bicyclist um, or pedestrian, might dart into the street. In, in the case of a senior, maybe the, they can't see the car coming, or the reflexes are slow, whatever. Or the child just doesn't have a uh, uh, isn't, isn't aware of the dangers uh, of doing what, what he or she is doing. But it's your fault 
and therefore motorists are forced to drive on the defensive. It is their fault if you hit the cyclist or the pedestrian, and that forces the motorist uh, to be more careful and to drive in a way that avoids endangering cyclists and pedestrians. Um, it's also important, of course, really important, I think, to train people to cycle and to walk safely, especially kids. Uh, one of the reasons they do this in Germany and in the Netherlands is because that's the way, main way they get to school. Uh, and so first, if you look over here to the left, this is in Berlin, by the way, they have these test courses. They're throughout Germany. Every city has these. Um, this fenced off, and they, the, they, the kids learn what the signs mean, where you stop, how you turn, and so forth and so on, on these test courses. Then they go out with real police officers, and they go out under real street conditions. They get tested with the police, and they get a certificate and a, a pennant that they put on the wall and a sticker for their bike, but they, it's a big deal, and every single German and Dutch kid by the third or fourth grade has comprehensive education, safety education, how to cycle and to walk safely. And so they can get to school walking and cycling safely. Um, and it's not, it's, training is great, but you know what else is great? They have the bike paths actually leading to the school. It's not a bad idea when you're considering where to put your bicycling infrastructure to include them uh, along where the sites of schools so the kids can get to those schools safely. So combined with very thorough and really tested uh, training uh, of the kids in the third, fourth grade, you also provide these very safe bikeway facilities. I think this is a, a especially an important reason why we should be encouraging more walking and cycling, especially among children. This is a recent study of 20,000 Danish school children. Uh, and they found that those kids who walked or biked to school, now get this, look at that, look at this greed part. That's, that's what, I know it's a weird color to choose, but anyway, mental alertness advanced to the equivalent of someone half a year further in their studies. Just walking or biking to school did that. It increased the, their mental alertness by one half year in their studies. It had more of an impact on improving school performance than eating breakfast and lunch. You want healthy kids? You want kids who can learn well? Get them to walk and cycle to school. And there are ways to do it safely. So I know there are parents out there who say, oh, no, not for my kid. It's too dangerous. Well, it certainly works in the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, and virtually all of Scandinavia. And we can make it work here in the United States as well. Bike training, again, is crucial, but in the United States, it's all voluntary. This is actually in New Jersey, and I think it's great that these programs exist. Absolutely support these, but it should be compulsory. It should not be simply voluntary. Maybe 1% of kids get this sort of bike training. That means 99% of Americans, don't, American kids don't get this sort of training. They haven't a clue how you cycle safely. Uh, likewise for adults. Okay, let's say you didn't get the training as a kid. Maybe you can get the training as an adult, but it's, it's again, voluntary, and I'm pretty sure 99% of adults have never had a course on uh, safe cycling. Uh, I think there's a number of promotional programs. Uh, I'm not sure if that's quite the word to use, but things you can do also to encourage cycling and to legitimize cycling as a, as, as a, a normal way to get around. What is putting police on bikes? I took this photo and they were so kind, they were so nice to me. Uh, I'm surprised they put up with me. This is in Sydney, Australia. This is actually on my daily walk uh, or bike ride to work. Um, but I think police on bikes is important because that way the police are seeing the perspective and the needs of a cyclist from the, from the from the point of view, from the saddle of a bike, and it makes a difference whether you're a policeman in a police car looking through the windshield of a car or if you're on the bike. So other promotional events, I'm almost, almost finished, folks, so we're, <laughs> you'll get a chance to ask a few questions. Uh, but these uh, cyclovias or summer streets or, anyway, car-free uh, days, I think, are really great ways uh, to promote cycling. It just it gets everyone involved. It gets people on bikes who maybe haven't had their bike out of their basement for years and years and years. It's a fun event. It just generates enthusiasm. It's just a great thing to do. And there are now hundreds. I'm not sure how many hundreds of these around the world. This happens to be in New York City. They call them summer streets. Uh, this is uh, in Los Angeles. And of course, they call it Cic La Via. 
Um, and that's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Every year they hold it, it's more and more popular, now have over 100,000 participants. Uh, but you can do it for small cities as well. This is in Somerville, Massachusetts, and it doesn't have to be some tremendous, humongous, expensive affair. You just close the street to cars and you have a lot of fun. Uh, you can also have, we have the Safe Routes to School program, or at least had it before the federal government cut its funding, but many cities still have uh, continued to thank goodness. I think it's extremely important uh, that we encourage kids to walk and to bike to school, and it means having either other parents or uh, some sort of traffic guards helping kids across intersections and so forth. I can understand how many parents would be hesitant to let their kids just walk or bike to school. To know that there's going to be other parents walking with this group of kids, having a walking school bus, I think it's just a, a really great idea. Uh, you can have a bike to school day, make it a, a fun event for the kids. Uh, you can have a bike to work day, make it a fun event for adults. The funny thing is, uh, they ask us at Rutgers University in New Jersey to register for Bike to Work Day. I'm thinking, well, sure, I bike to work every day. <laughs> Not a problem. Give employees free bikes. I mean, uh, for most American firms, we give employees uh, very cheap, uh, if not free, parking. Uh, actually, uh, if you uh, know Don Choup's work at UCLA, it's like 90% of all parking uh, for Americans who commute to work is free. Uh, well, instead of giving people free parking, give them free bikes. It's the perfect zero emissions vehicle. You can also have guided bike tours uh, for seniors. Well, we go into a lot of these aspects of especially promoting cycling uh, in the new book we just did with MIT Press called City Cycling. Um, and we have special chapters, in fact, on cycling and women, uh, cycling and children. And we didn't write all those chapters. <laughs> Believe me, we would never dare to write a chapter on, on women, uh, so we have the three leading, the world's three leading experts, actually, on women and cycling. Uh, Jennifer Dill, uh, Jan Gerard, and Susan Handy wrote that chapter. But then anyway, we have chapters on the health benefits of cycling, which, by the way, exceed uh, what the, uh, the, I have three public health colleagues who did that chapter, and they did a thorough review of the literature, and they found that all the studies find that the health benefits of cycling exceed the risks the traffic risks of cycling by a ratio of 10 to 1 all the way up to 20 to 1. So those of you who are hesitant to encourage cycling because you think it's too dangerous, all of the public health studies show in spite of the admitted uh, dangers of cycling on the roadway, I mean they're not, they do exist, but in spite of that the health benefits are so enormous they offset the costs by a ratio of 10 to 1 or even 20 to 1, depending on which study you're looking at, which country it is. Okay, we're at the end now. Conclusions. Um, first of all, I don't, uh, I'm not sure you'll be participating in this seminar if you didn't believe this, but uh, I do believe that walking and cycling are the most sustainable means of getting around our cities. I think they make our cities more livable and safer, and they're also just healthier. It's They're healthy ways to get around our cities, and they're also made they reduce air pollution, they reduce noise, they make the cities healthier for everybody. Uh, they produce a, a broad range of environmental, social, economic, and health benefits. And the really good news is it's not a secret, it's not a mystery how to make walking and cycling safer. You can look at other cities in the United States, you can look to Canada, you can look to Europe, you can look to Australia, it's not a secret. You can go there and look in person. How did they do this? How did Portland increase by tenfold the amount of cycling in the last 25 years? How did New York City quadruple the level of cycling over the past 10 or 20 years? I mean, go and look. It's possible, and it's possible to make it safer at the same time. I have yet to see a study that showed a city that undertook these measures increased cycling where it then became more dangerous. So I think it's really important just to note that there really are tools out there for you. There really are tested, proven ways to increase walking and cycling at the same time making them uh, safer. Another point, what I made at the beginning of the presentation, even though we are very sprawled here in the United States, and believe me, I've, I've been here in North Carolina now for the last three months, and this is a very sprawled, low-density metropolitan area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. And yet there are tons of trips you could make by walking and cycling. And for the United States as a whole, to repeat that statistic, 41% of all trips are two miles or shorter, 
and 25% are a mile or shorter. So we certainly have enough trips short enough to make by walking or cycling. And we can really find specific examples of how to do this all over the world, but also not just over the world. You don't have to cross the Atlantic Ocean. You can go to Portland or Seattle or New York City or a number of cities right here in the United States and see what works. How do they do this? And politically, how do they get it implemented? Because that's important too. But I'd better stop there so that you have a chance to ask some questions. I would like to, again, thank every single person who's participating in this webinar for taking the time to listen, uh, and especially if it's as beautiful where you are today as it is here in North Carolina, for sacrificing a nice walk or a bike ride outside on this beautiful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. All right, uh, we do have some time for questions. About about 10 minutes right now. Um, so I'm going to start going through your questions. If you have not already put your question in, go ahead and type it in the question box, and I'll try to get through it. Uh, we we have already received a lot of questions, so uh, uh, I'll do what I can to get through as many as possible. Uh, the first question is, what would be uh, the three most um, economically efficient ways of promoting walking and bicycling in an area? Mm -hmm. I think one would be uh, bicyclist and pedestrian safety training for all children. Um, I think number two would be traffic calming of residential neighborhoods because I don't think it requires much and you get a big bang for your buck. I think third would be introducing cycle tracks on arterials where there is a lot of traffic, where there is heavy traffic, um, but I, I think the investments should be less on purely recreational facilities and more on facilities that lead to utilitarian destinations. So just to, to summarize, number one, I would say much, much better and comp uh, compulsory, comprehensive traffic safety education for all children, including walking and cycling. Number two, traffic calming of all residential neighborhoods at 30 kilometers an hour, that'd be 20 miles an hour or, or less. And um, number three, what was my number three again? <laughs> um, Oh, I've lost, uh, what was the number three? Oh, the cycle tracks. The, uh, putting cycle tracks along arterials where you have leading toward key destinations where you know you're going to have a high volume of traffic uh, and you don't really want cyclists to be endangered by a heavy volume of traffic with lots of trucks and buses. Okay. Uh, this is a longer question. In the U.S., a significant barrier to implementation of this great stuff is that transportation planning begins with the assumption that accommodating forecasted travel demand patterns is the baseline of everything we do. How do these European cities do things like modeling and planning, and how do they address travel behavior, like SOV travel, that doesn't conform to their goals? Well, European cities have a bit of an advantage over American cities. Uh, number one, <laughs> the cost of car use and ownership is much higher than in the United States. So it is less uh, irresistible than it is in the United States. Uh, we make with free parking and uh, relatively cheap uh, gas prices, uh, a third or a half of what they are in Europe, uh, that is a deterrent in itself. But I think there's more environmental awareness in Europe uh, about the the importance of walking and cycling and also of public transportation. I also do not think that European planners feel they should simply accommodate whatever the demand is for automobiles. There are so many studies, this, is this notion of induced demand, every study I have ever shown shows the following. If you build more roads, <laughs> it's, a, it's almost the same thing, build it and they will come. You build more roads, you build wider roads, wider lanes, I can guarantee you, you will generate more car traffic and faster car traffic, and you're almost certainly going to discourage walking and cycling. And I think the attitude of the European planner says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we don't want to do this. That is, our goal is not to maximize the flow of cars, it's to accommodate, to, to optimize our overall transportation system and to make it as balanced as possible. And that word balanced is key. What do we mean by a balanced transportation system? We mean a system where walking and cycling and public transit are also options, not just the car. 
And so if you go to Europe, you'll find that most Europeans also have cars. It's not as if most Europeans are car free. It's just not true. But they're more likely to have one car per household uh, instead of two or three or four, which is often the case here in the United States. So the point simply is that I think planners, including not only transportation planners, but also transportation engineers, look at this in a different way in Europe. That they're more used to conserving resources, and you just don't give people everything they want. Uh, just because people want to drive their cars, you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to let you destroy these residential neighborhoods. We're not going to let you destroy the centers of the cities. And, and, and let me just follow up on whether, I'm sorry that this answer is so long, but it's important to understand the political context of this. If you look back at the 1950s and 1960s, that's exactly what European cities were doing. They were trying to accommodate the car. They were trying to build European cities according to the American model, namely accommodating the demand for parking, building roads, widening roads. And then after two decades of doing this, they discovered it was a disaster. They were destroying their central cities. They were had a huge increase, especially in child fatalities and injuries. And they said, whoa, stop, end to this. And they completely changed their policy. So I think Part of it is a reaction to what they observed as a very negative impact of accommodating the automobile. And part of accommodating the automobile, to get back to your original question, is saying, well, we'll just every time there's more car traffic, every time we see a traffic jam, we'll build more roads or widen the roads. I don't think that's the answer. In, uh, in fact, in the UK, there have been some studies showing that when you reduce roadway capacity, take out a lane or two, make the lanes more narrow, take out a, a, a road altogether. Incredibly enough, maybe it's not so incredible, the travel demand disappears. And so I think the, the, the bottom line is that Europeans have been much, much less willing to accommodate whatever people forecast as increases in, in travel demand. And those, those, the models we use in the United States estimate an artificially low price, real cost, environmental, social, and economic cost of driving your car. And I think if in these forecasting models that transition planners use here in the United States, if they put in a realistic price, a cost of car use, they would then find that there would be much less uh, demand for car use as well. Okay. Um, my next question is, are there any successful methods for mitigating the problem of vehicles loading and unloading in bike lanes? Yeah, that's a tough, it's a tough one in a city like New York City because there's almost no other place to do it. Uh, I, I think one way to get around it is perhaps restricting the times. Let, let's assume, I mean, in New York City in particular, there's a real problem with a lack of alleyways on the side or, or back entrances where you could unload things. And that's one of the reasons there's so much of this loading and unloading in bike lanes uh, in New York City. And so part of it is almost unavoidable. But I think what could be done is to at least limit the times of day when it's done. I mean, you could limit it to, I don't know, before 6 o'clock in the morning or maybe after 11 o'clock in the evening. And by doing that, on the one hand, you can load and unload then, and, and admittedly, it's going, to bike, uh, it's going to block those bike lanes at those times. But presumably, from 11 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm sorry, 11 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, it's not going to be really a problem. This is what happens with car-free zones in Europe as well. I mean, they, they, have, uh, they have stores in these car-free zones in Europe. If you go to Munich or Hamburg or, or Paris, anywhere, you can find a car-free zone. And what they do is they have deliveries mainly at night or very early in the morning. And then the, all these cars and well, the trucks leave by whatever, 7 or 8 or, or so o'clock in the morning. So I think that the solution is, they, I still think that these sorts of delivery vehicles, when they're blocking bike lanes during the day, should be very seriously ticketed uh, and towed away. But I think that they have to be given some opportunity to, uh, to get deliveries and maybe just restrict it to the night. Okay. Um, what would you say are the best ways to use infrastructure to encourage cycling in, win in the winter? And also on that same topic or similar topic, what kind of things can people do to encourage more cycling in hot weather, such as planting trees? Wow. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, actually, believe it or not, there are cities, I can't remember the names of them now, but there are cities, in fact, uh, that have uh, heated bike lanes or heated cycle tracks so that um, you, in fact, can cycle and the, the snow just melts because it's, they have heating coils under the bike, bikeways. That's not because it happened very often, but one thing you can certainly do is give priority to shoveling snow from the bike lane and the bike path. And guess what? In Denmark and in the Netherlands, the bike lanes get shoveled before the rest of the roadway. Now, that certainly would encourage cycling uh, in the winter. Uh, and so I can, those are, that comes to mind immediately. That it's, it's actually done. This is not just theoretical, but uh, it's actually a policy in uh, both the Netherlands and in Denmark. It's you first shovel the bicycling facility, then you shovel the facility for the cars. Uh, again, a matter of priorities. In terms of how you get around the summer, um, that's an issue. I think one way to get around it is or to deal with it. I mean, I arrive to work. I cycle in the summer more than, than ever. And I arrive at work sweaty, too. I have a change of clothes. But it would be really nice to have showers at work. And I think that some cities, in fact, have even passed legislation that make showers at work compulsory. And I think that's a great idea, to have lockers and to have showers at work. Because I think, especially here in the southeast, one of the reasons people wouldn't bike to work is you, we have a very high level of humidity. And it's very warm in the summer. And so you would arrive at work totally sweaty. But that's not a problem if you have showers and lockers and change facilities. Um, and so I think that's the way to deal with the issue of getting hot and sweaty in the summer. OK. Uh, Multi-use paths and uh, roads converted to plazas put bicyclists and pedestrians into the same path. Um, are there any issues with cyclists and pedestrians colliding? And what would you recommend as a, a safe speed limit in such places? Uh, we've seen postings of anywhere from 7 to 20 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. Well, I think 20 kilometers per hour is much too fast. <laughs> uh, I um, in New Jersey in particular, I'm cycling on mixed-use paths a lot. And there are a lot of conflicts. Uh, it depends on the volume. The, the, the degree of the conflict depends on the volume of cycling and the volume of walking. The, at off-peak times, so for example, in the middle of the day, this is a particular sort of a, a bike, uh, a greenway that, that I walk on in New Jersey, there's almost no conflict at all because there's very few people walking, so I can cycle around, there's just no conflict. But it, where you have a lot of people cycling and a lot of people walking, I think it is a conflict. And I think there's two ways of dealing with it. One, you could actually have a line uh, down the center of this uh, mixed-use path and say, OK, could bicyclists please keep to the left and pedestrians keep to the right? That, something like that would help. Um, a second uh, approach to that, and, and, and I think it's really important, I think that I have been on mixed-use paths, in fact, that very one that I use almost every day in New Jersey, where sometimes there'll be cyclists without bells on their bikes. And of course, I'm cycling at maybe 10 miles an hour at most, uh, probably even slower than that. And all of a sudden, zooms by uh, a racing bicyclist and scares, uh, scares me to death. And it scares other pedestrians as well. So I, th I really think a, a realistic speed limit would be more something like 7 miles an hour or maybe even 5 miles, or maybe certainly much less than 20 miles an hour. I think that's much too fast um, for a mixed-use path. It, at least, I think it's too fast for a mixed-use path that's heavily used. I mean, you could probably, maybe you could have different speed limits at different times of day, but from my experience, um, for example, if, if my sister lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there's a, a very extensive greenway system. But it's the most heavily used on the weekends, and then right after sort of quitting time, so maybe from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock uh, in the evening on weekdays, but then mostly on the weekends. And that's when it's most heavily used. You could have a lower speed limit then, and maybe on, on off hours, that is when the, when the path is not as likely to be used uh, to have a higher speed limit. But I still think it would be really useful to have some sort of delineation, even on a mixed-use path, and say, in general, would pedestrians please keep to the right and cyclists to the left? I think it gives at least a little bit of guidance as to where people can be. With 
partial road closures and openings for pedestrians and bicyclists. Have there been any issues where uh, it's created any problems for emergency responders, or have there been any pushback from emergency responders to those types of uh, infrastructure? Uh, there's been a lot of pushback in the United States, <laughs> but not in Europe. Um, that they have, uh, I mean, some of these obstacles are, how can I put it, um, they're like posts that can be removed or they actually depress into the ground if you have a key for it. Um, and, I mean, believe me, there's a, as many emergency vehicles in these European cities with this very extensive traffic calming as, as there are in the United States. Somehow they deal with it. Uh, I haven't really studied in detail how these emergency vehicles sort of cope with these uh, artificial dead ends and so forth and so on in Europe. But, but I do know I've seen many bollards that are either removable or if you have the key, it does something or other and it goes into the ground so the emergency vehicle can then uh, get through. But I think I mean, what I've been told is, at least in New Jersey, the, the number one opponent to these artificial dead ends or almost any kind of traffic comedy, even a traffic circle, will be the fire department. <laughs> because they say, how are our fire engines going to get through? Uh, but you know, they have fire engines in Europe as well. I mean, every Dutch city, every German city, every Danish city, I mean, they have fire engines, EMS vehicles, and so forth, and they deal with it, even though 90% of their neighborhoods are traffic calm. So I can't tell you the full details, I mean, because it's not that I don't know, but it is that I don't know. I mean, if I knew all the details, I would tell you, but I think there are ways of accommodating, for sure, emergency vehicles. They have to accommodate emergency vehicles in these European cities. So the the answer is, even though I don't know all the exact details, with 100 percent certainty, I can tell you that these emergency vehicles are accommodated in all of these kinds of traffic calming situations in European cities. Okay, and this will be our, our last question for today. We're running a little long. Um, with cycle tracks, have there been any issues with drivers, particularly elderly drivers who, who may not have as good a sight or vision, uh, who mistake the cycle track lanes for, for lanes for driving cars? And how do you address, address that issue? Well, you can make, I mean, one is the use of bollards, so you can't, well, you could put bollards, I really don't like the use of bollards uh, to do this, but you could conceivably put a bollard in the middle of the cycle track, which then prevents a car. I mean, they do this on many uh, mixed-use paths at any rate, at least in New Jersey they do it, and that prevents any kind of a motor vehicle from getting at all on the cycle track. But I think it's a dangerous obstacle for the cyclists as well. If you're not paying attention, you can have a serious uh, injury, and they, they don't have those uh, in, in the Netherlands now. They've sort of pretty much done away with them. Um, but it can happen, I mean, uh, on the, um, even on the best bicycling facility that New York City has, which is the West Side Greenway or the Hudson River Greenway is actually what it's called. I mean, it's, it's very well designed, and you would think it would just be impossible for anyone to, uh, to uh, by accident, uh, get onto that with a car. And yet someone did and killed. I'm not sure if it killed a pedestrian or a cyclist. Um, there was almost no penalty, by the way, for that, uh, the driver of that motor vehicle. But I think it's almost impossible to completely avoid the possibility that someone may, by mistake, uh, drive a car onto a cycle track. It's not impossible. I'm sure it does occasionally happen, but I don't think that, I think the risk of that happening is small enough that uh, the huge benefits of a cycle track far outweigh whatever risks there are of someone by accident, uh, I mean by mistake, I mean, uh, getting, driving onto a cycle track. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for discussion. I am sorry if we did not get to your question. Once again, a PDF copy of the presentation slides will be available. Uh, that should be up on the Internet later today at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. And a recording of today's program will be posted to that site uh, in about two weeks. Uh, I'll also be posting it to our YouTube channel. That's www.youtube.com slash petbikeinfo uh, around that time as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook for updates. That's facebook.com slash pedbike. Finally, I want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Thank you again to our speaker, John Pooker, and thank you to all of you for attending today's PBIC Local Communities webinar.